that's great. And, and, and a few years ago, uh, and this conversation Abe and I had last night, is that we used to say, don't even worry about getting your university to divest just yet. We're not there yet. We need to build the campaign. We need to start the conversation. We need to get our institutions and our communities to question why it is wrong to be in support of Israel, why it is wrong to take uh, support for Israel as for, for granted or as necessary. So we need to start that conversation. And when the questioning uh, reaches the critical mass, divestment will follow. So we always measured success of divestment campaign in those steps, in those you know, measurable steps of, of success of creating the discussion of endorsements from labor unions, from churches, from university academic bodies. It's a, it's a little harder to make that argument now. Yes, divestment just happened, so thanks, Hampshire. I, the, you know, <laughs> no, I, I need to change my, uh, my argument. But, but it, it is, you know, keeping that in mind, if it happens, it's great. Uh, if it doesn't happen, it will happen. Just remember that you are part of an, a, a global movement that is putting pressure uh, in, in one direction. And when the critical mass builds, there will be a snowballing effect. So the fact that you're doing a lot of work, a lot of, uh, putting in a lot of effort, engaging in a lot of debates and conversations right now, but not seeing measurable successes just yet, you don't have to worry about that because you are building momentum towards that big goal of applying pressure on Israel. So your campaign should be viewed or considered in those uh, milestones, should be considered in, in the momentum it builds, in the, in the debate it creates about the legitimacy of Israel and, and uh, the legitimacy of its policies and its treatment of, uh, of Palestinians uh, within, within its control. Uh, another, another aspect of, of divestment that it does bring this global distant problem into a local context. So instead of asking people within your community to just talk about Palestine and Israel or worry about Palestine and Israel, right now you are giving them a reason to question that matter as it pertains to them, as it pertains to their investments. Their lifestyle has a direct impact on what uh, goes on in Palestine. So you are bringing uh, this problem to their doorstep and forcing them to consider it, think about it, and even take a stand. So this is the power of divestment and, and boycott, that it, you really localize the problem and make it a lot more uh, tangible to them rather than an abstract uh, international matter. Number 11. It's, uh, it's going to happen. <laughs> so BDS is also a tested strategy. Uh, Catherine will, will uh, comment on that in a little more detail uh, in a few minutes. But divestment, the reason why we consider divestment back in 2000, 2001 is that it, we had a lot of successful examples to build off of. There was the Montgomery boycotts in, in Alabama in the, during the civil rights, the, the labor the great boycotts of the, of the labor movement, but more importantly, the anti-apartheid divestment movement that is a, a lot closer example to what we are trying to do. So you have a time-tested, proven, successful strategy that we've seen it work, that's seen it transform power and, and take the decision-making process from the halls of power in Washington to uh, small organizations and individuals and street all over the country or all over the world. So this, it happened. So don't be, don't be uh, too pessimistic that it, it's going to be difficult or impossible. It really happened and it can happen again once we build that critical mess. Another aspect of, of the divestment is that it gives you an opportunity to question Israel's legitimacy here. You're not just protesting Israel's invasion of, siege and invasion of Gaza, you're not protesting the settlements, you're not protesting the invasion of Lebanon. You are questioning the legitimacy of Israel, the way it defines itself, or lack thereof. Uh, which is, I don't know if you, many of you know, Israel still does not define its own borders within its laws. So it, it's still uh, open for interpretation or expansion if, if, uh, if, when they have the chance. So you can bring these issues, the, 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 the larger context questions, to the table 
you, you, you're, not, you're no longer defensive in your, in your actions and, and your activism to respond to one thing or another that's Israel doing. You bring the discussion to the nature of Israel, the way it defines itself, the way it carries out its, its apartheid policies, and force Israel and its defendants on the, uh, uh, on the, on the defensive. The, the, the characterization of Israel by a, as a pariah state globally is perhaps the single most, the single thing that they fear the most. Uh, the moment that Israelis uh, are, are denied visas to go backpacking through South America or, or, uh, or denied business permits to go do business in Thailand, uh, th they will realize that they've gone too far. That, that's, that will be the limit where they're going to be forced to question uh, their, uh, their government's policies because at that point it will be in direct contradiction to what they do. This is Sadiq. Uh, he, uh, so this is, this is my little brother. Uh, a few years back, he's not as innocent now. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he's still a, you know, a smart ass though, and very savvy. She's my language. Uh, but uh, this, this picture is uh, of, the, of, the, of Israel's annexation wall, the, the fence part. This is where it cuts through our uh, olive orchard. And in the background, those are the houses of my, uh, my uncles and, and the other half of my family that we no longer have any physical contact with since the wall was built. Uh, so if, if, if we are to achieve real justice in, in Palestine, if we are to achieve equality uh, for all people, if we are to achieve a, a form of just peace uh, that allows me to go back one day and visit my aunt in that house that I can see from the, from the other side of the fence, and, and actually see her personally, then it's not going to be uh, the, the strategies of, of complaining about Israel building settlements or the strategy of, about Israel occupying the West Bank. It has to be a strategy like BDS that, just like I mentioned a few minutes ago, offers you an opportunity to question Israel's nature and the true natures of Israel's policies as they apply to all Palestinians in all of uh, historic Palestine and the way it refuses to grant equal rights to all of its populations. Some of the recent successes with the BDS movement have come uh, very recently, uh, or, or 2009 has been, now that we established this is 2009, uh, have, have come uh, you know, from, from all over the world. But some of the, uh, the most striking ones is that they're newly outspoken Israeli academics and intellectuals that just this year, in light of, of BDS successes and pressure around the world, that they started speaking up and questioning their own government's policies. Uh, one example is, uh, is the Israeli academic Nav Gordon, uh, a professor at Ben Gurion University. He wrote an article in the LA Times a few months ago, a very, you know, a, a fairly scathing article criticizing Israel's policies, and it was all motivated and inspired by the pressure that he started noticing uh, from the outside world and interpreted as dissatisfaction, discontent with his policy, and he knew should the Israeli policies continue, this pressure will continue, him and his uh, fellow academics and colleagues will not be able to participate you know, in, in, in the global arena, in their fields, and they begin to speak up against their government policies right now. No. Uh, I, I just wasted the joke there. Uh, uh, another, uh, 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 an interesting anecdote about, about the, uh, 